It is good to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, when you fill in for the pastor, you have to copy what he says also. That's one of the requirements. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I certainly hope that you do, I'd ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 13. So we continue looking at the kingdom parables. This will be our excuse me, third message from Matthew 13. And we're going to look at the influence of or on and the value of the kingdom. We'll begin here in just a minute in verse 31. Wednesday, we looked at Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and then 36 to 43, which is the parable of the tares and the wheat, and then 36 to 43 is Jesus' explanation. Our passage this morning is going to cover the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. And Jesus is going to tell us the value of the kingdom. And we're also going to look at the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great value. So we'll be looking at four very short parables this morning. First two are all about the influence of and the influence on the kingdom of heaven. And the second two are about the value of the kingdom of heaven. This time, if you would, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started this morning. Precious Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. We just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here in your house. We thank you, Lord God, for this time we've had together where we just give praise and honor and glory to you. We've taken time to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for these songs of Zion, Lord, how we just lift up your name. We praise you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all you do. We ask, Lord God, you bless each and every name added to the prayer list this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Be with all those that are already on the prayer list. Lord, some have been on there for years and years and years, Lord, but we don't grow weary. We keep coming to you. We keep bringing them and their needs to you, Lord. We know, Lord God, you know their needs better than we do. We keep asking, Lord. We'll keep asking until you either answer our prayer, Lord, or tell us to quit praying for them. But we ask, Lord, heal those that need healing. Comfort those that need comforting, Lord, as only you can provide, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, most of all, Lord, burden the hearts of those that do not know you as Lord and Savior. For we realize, Lord, and we know time is running short. We hope, Lord God, that you open their eyes and that even today would be the day they give their lives to you. Lord, we do love you and thank you for all you do for us. And we ask you, Lord, bless us, open up the hearts and minds of everyone here in the pews, everyone that will watch or listen live or later and here in the pulpit, Lord. We do thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. And it is always in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So first, the parable of the mustard seed. <coughs> Verses 31 and 32. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This little two-verse parable seems to give commentators and others fits sometimes. If you read, say, ten different commentators, you may get a even five-five split on what Jesus is actually saying in these two verses. Some agree that it's about the influence of the kingdom and some will say it's the influence on the kingdom. We're going to look at both this morning. So we'll look at first at the context or the interpretation 
but then the application. And we'll do the same thing when we get to the parable of the leaven, <coughs> excuse me, which also seems to divide commentators for similar reasons. But first thing I want you to notice, notice what Jesus says here, because it's very important how he starts off. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. That's very clear. He's saying the mustard seed in the parable represents the kingdom. That's not the part that really divides the commentators. We'll get there. So there's no confusion there. That's what he's saying. The, the kingdom of heaven, the church, the body of Christ is like this tiny mustard seed that a man sows in his field. And Jesus goes on to say that this is smaller than any other seeds. <laughs> this trips people up too because you'll have scientists say, but the mustard seed is not the smallest seed there is. He didn't say it was the smallest of all seeds. He's saying it's the smallest of all the garden seeds. Make no mistake about it. He is the creator of every kind of seed there ever has been. He knows what he's talking about. He is the foremost expert on all things. But that trips some of our scientists up. It trips even some believers up. Jesus knows what he's talking about. This is the smallest seed of the seeds that would be sown by a person. And when it is full grown, it can become larger than the garden plants and it can even become the size of a tree. Now a mustard seed is a bush, technically speaking. But it can grow. And it can grow to the point where it is the size of a tree. <coughs> The point Jesus is making here is, although it starts off small, it can grow large enough to provide a resting place for the birds. Again, there have been instances where we have, history has shown that these shrubs can grow as large as up to 15 feet. I don't know about you, but that certainly, in my book, qualifies as being very tree-like. The birds that he mentions is the part that really is the dividing part in the parable. So Jesus is saying this. This is the interpretation. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that is sown. And as it grows, it becomes larger and larger until it's large enough to support the birds of the air. Who come and make its nest in it. The birds of the air in this interpretation is us, it's the Gentiles. They're not part of the original plant. They're not part of the actual plant, you could say. The plant, the mustard seed, that is the Jews. The church starts, the kingdom starts with the Jews, God's chosen people. And as it grows, as the church grew and grew and grew, Gentiles came into it. Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 and 23 has a similar thought. Noting that God would take a sprig from the top of the cedar and set it out on the mountain and it will grow big enough to bear fruit and become a stately cedar. One little sprig will grow to become a stately cedar and birds of every kind will nest under it and in the shade of its branches. In Ezekiel's parable here, or as God speaks through Ezekiel, the sprig is Israel. The beginning of the kingdom. The birds, again, represent the Gentiles, just like we have here. Then in Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 6, God speaking through Ezekiel says, The birds are nations who seek security in Egypt. Daniel chapter 4, verse 21 has Daniel talking about Nebuchadnezzar's vision of himself as a mighty tree and birds nesting in it. All of these different places mention birds and how they are seeking security and peace. So Jesus is saying in his parable they are seeking security and peace in the kingdom. 
The birds, the Gentiles come and seek peace and security in God's kingdom. Now, in our application, we'll look at first how it's the influence of the kingdom. We are to be welcoming to the birds that are out there. To all those who are lost, we are to be a place of safety and security, a refuge where they can come in, hear God's Word, praise and worship Him, hear the Word, so that the Holy Spirit will begin to draw them. The seed of faith will be planted in their hearts. God will draw them to Jesus and hopefully they will submit to Him as their personal Lord and Savior and make the kingdom their home. Those who argue and say the birds are not the Gentiles coming into the church apply this as a warning. And I think we can look at it both ways. They say this is not the influence of the church, but this is an influence on the church. So in this warning application, we make sure when we welcome in the lost, and we try to provide a place for them to feel safe and they can come and hear God's Word, we must ensure we are doing the influencing on them. We don't allow them to influence us. It's about external influence. We must draw hard lines that will not be allowed to be moved. We must say, this is the true doctrine of from the Bible, we can't waver on it. Because as we allow people to come in, they come in with their own, sometimes they come in with their own agendas. We looked at the, uh, excuse, me, <coughs> excuse me, the parable of the wheat and tares. Sometimes the tares come in, Satan plants them in with the wheat to tear down the church. We must make sure we don't allow them to influence what we're doing here, but we try to influence them to come to really know God. So we must draw hard lines when it comes to doctrine. We must make sure that while we welcome all who come in, we certainly don't condone their sinful lifestyles. We don't uphold them. We make sure that we don't allow the world and its current temporary ruler and his people to influence the church. We must be the influence, not those who are influenced. As this mustard seed grows, which is the church, again, we influence. We are the place the birds come in. We don't allow us to be influenced. We don't compromise on doctrine. We don't compromise on what sin is and what it is not. And see, we would do that if we start condoning their lifestyles. If we start allowing them to say, as many churches have, that what God used to say is sin is no longer sin. No. Sin hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. God will not change. We don't compromise on God's place on our list of priorities in life. These are things we draw our hard lines on. We don't compromise. If we don't draw these hard lines, we run the risk as the church to allow the birds to influence us. We must make sure that it's the tree or the shrub influencing the birds. <coughs> so again, in context, Jesus is saying the church starts off small, as it grows, it is a place for the birds to come in, the Gentiles. But we can apply it as both influence of and influence on the church. That's the parable of the mustard seed. Now we'll look at the parable of the leaven and then Jesus will tell us the reason for parable. Verse 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. Just like the parable we just looked at, 
This is a parable of the influence of and on the church when we apply it. First, we'll look at the interpretation and then the application. Now, the part that really divides people on this one is leaven. Okay? Leaven, as you know, is often used as a picture of sin. But not always. Notice what Jesus says. Wording is very important. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all left. <coughs> How can the kingdom of heaven, in this particular use of the word, be like sin? So again, I remind you, not every time we see leaven in the Bible is it used as a picture of sin. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. This is why this is the influence of the church. This is our influence on the world. But again, it can be applied as a warning also. The world is the pecks of flour. We are to influence the world. We start off small, just like a little lump of leaven, just a little bit of yeast, and when it's the gospel is preached and the church grows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The church influences the world. We act as a sort of retaining wall. As Brother Tony mentioned this morning in Sunday school, he was talking about the Berlin Wall dividing. Well, in a sense, that's what the church does. We're a retaining wall. We're holding back the evil and the sinfulness of the world to an extent. We're holding back the darkness so that it doesn't fully and wholly consume the earth. This is why we learn in Revelation, starting in chapter 5, to, ver or to, excuse me, to chapter 18, when we're raptured away, it gets very bad very quickly. That retaining wall is gone. Jesus said we are the light of the world. And when you take the light away, it's total darkness. So just as in this parable, as the woman puts the leaven into the flour, God has put His church into this world. There is a reason why when we get saved, He doesn't instantly take us to heaven. We've got work to do. We're to be that retaining wall. We're to interact with the world. We're to influence the world and not let the world influence us. And we will do so until such a time when God decides that all the dough is leavened. In this case, the church is full and He calls us home. And again, I say to you, I think that time is getting very close, very near. As the yeast in the dough quickly spreads until all the dough is leavened, the church continues to minister to the lost. And we do all we can to be instruments of the Holy Spirit to draw people to Jesus. We don't save anybody. We introduce them to the gospel and then God will give them the gift of faith and they must choose to accept it. God will start drawing them to His Son and they must choose to accept it. We are in the world just as the leaven is in the flower. Now when we apply the parable we can see that it can also be a warning. This would be an internal warning, or warning against internal influence. Okay. <coughs> As those who are in the church have the ability to influence, we must make sure it's not a negative influence. In the parable of the mustard seed, we said as the birds came in, we welcome people to come in and worship. They can influence the kingdom from the outside coming in. But the kingdom can also be influenced by those who have been in the kingdom even for a long time. We're talking here not just about our local assembly, but the church as a whole can have negative influences from within. 
What does this look like? Well, we start by false teachers. People who come in and teach and preach. And after a while, they think they have a revelation from God and or they think they've heard somebody else say it and they believe it and next thing you know, they went off true doctrine to false doctrine. And they start teaching it. They start preaching it. They may start off as genuine teachers, but they get influenced. Someone introduces false doctrine or they come up with it on their own from some other source and then they bring it into the church. And if we allow those false teachers to do this, before we know it, the whole church is influenced. This is how you get whole, even denominations, going off on these false doctrine tangents. And next thing you know, they're not even preaching God's Word. They get influenced by the world, by the ruler of the world. They introduce false doctrine. They start giving people a false hope and a false sense of security. When we don't stick to what true biblical doctrine is, that's exactly what we're doing. We're giving people false hope. When we tell people or we allow people to think that living together is no longer a sin, oh, they're just as good as marriage. No, we're giving them false hope. We're saying God's changed. We know the Bible clearly, clearly teaches us God cannot and will not change. As God revealed Himself going all the way back <clears throat> excuse me, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to today, God has not changed. God will not change. What was sin in Abraham's day, in Moses' day, in Jesus' day is still sin today. We don't want people to have a false sense of security. We don't want people to have false hope. We must stay sound in our biblical doctrine. That's why it is very important for all of us to know what God's Word says so that we know when somebody gets up here and they start teaching or preaching, we know if they're teaching what God's Word says or not. You never crack your Bible open until Brother Daniel or myself or somebody else is up here preaching. You don't know what we're going to lead you to believe. But if you know what God's Word says, you'll know immediately if we go off on some weird doctrine. At that point, it would be your responsibility as the church to say, you need to sit down, you're wrong. As hard as that may be. We cannot allow influence from within to corrupt the church. This can also look like those in the kingdom, those in the church living a life in a backslidden state, and we do absolutely nothing about it. We turn a blind eye to it. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to talk about it. We let them live ever how they want to live. They know they're living in open sin. We know they're living in open sin. And we do nothing about it. We say nothing to them. We don't have church discipline. Eventually, if we let that go on and on and on, and more and more and more are influenced by that, Next thing you know, the whole church is influenced by that. The whole church is living however they want to live. And holiness is thrown out the window. That's why the Bible clearly teaches us that churches must have church discipline. I can think of a particular church that had absolutely no desire for church discipline. They were looking for a pastor. They had a guy in mind. They talked to him. The one deacon they had left talked to this guy. And he immediately told this pastor, candidate told the deacon, there will be church discipline if I become your pastor. Things will get cleaned up. Things will be done differently. Can you take a guess what happened? He didn't get the job. They didn't want him. They wanted to play church. They didn't want to be the church. This guy, this deacon, it had been reported to this guy that was being looked at as their pastor that he was living with a woman that he wasn't married to. So you can 
Bet your bottom dollar when church discipline was mentioned, he made his mind up right then and there. We don't want this guy. He's out of here. No. The church must have discipline. We cannot condone sinful lifestyles. We cannot condone those living in a backslidden state, pat them on the back and say, oh, it's okay. It's all right. You just keep doing however you want to do. You're fine. You know, if you live in a backslidden state long enough, you run the risk of apostasy. I said it Wednesday, apostasy is possible. It is very difficult for you to completely remove your faith in Christ once you've placed it there. But it is possible. And the longer you live in a backslidden state and you live in open sin, now we're talking here sins of presumption, not ignorance. Sins of ignorance are those sins that we commit every day and we don't even realize we're doing it until later God brings it to our attention. Sins of presumption are when we know exactly what we're doing and we say, God, we just don't care what you think about this anymore. We know it's wrong for a man and a woman not married to live together, to have relations with each other. We're going to do it anyway. We just don't care. Those are sins of presumption. If you stay in those long enough, you may wake up one morning and realize you just don't care about anything God says. God is no longer on your list of priorities in your life. That leads to... Maybe God's really not real, or maybe Jesus was just a man. Maybe I can be just as happy, just as fulfilled, just as secure, just as saved if I turn to Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam. That's apostasy. That's the risk. We must do church discipline according to how God said to do it. We can't just do it how we want to do it. Again, if we allow the influence to go in the wrong direction, we as the church become more worldly and less holy. And soon we find we're not even God's church anymore. <laughs> we're a social club at best, as in the, the church I was mentioning just a few minutes ago. Playing church, not being the church. I can only pray that they are no longer playing church, but that they are actually a part of the church now as they have a pastor. The parable of the leaven. <clears throat> now, look over at verses 34 and 35. Jesus is going to say something here. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and He did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. From this point on in Christ's ministry, He speaks to the crowds in parables. He has told His disciples back in verses 11 and 12 that He's using parables because they as true believers in Him have been granted the privilege of knowing the mysteries of heaven, but unbelievers have not been granted that privilege. The mysteries of heaven are simply truths not known in the Old Testament, but revealed during the New Testament. In verse 35, Matthew says that Jesus started speaking in parables to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. In this case here, the prophet is the psalmist. And Jesus specifically here, he's, or Matthew I should say, is quoting Psalm 78 verse 2. Those who are spiritual following Jesus, trusting in Jesus, believing in Jesus, will understand what He's talking about. Those who are not spiritual, those who don't believe, it's just gibberish and nonsense to them, these parables. These are the two parables on the influence of and the influence on the kingdom. Now let's look at the two that talk about the value of the kingdom. Verse 44. The parable of the hidden treasure. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. So Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in the field. It's not the field, it's the treasure in the field. 
Now, another way you can look at this, this is the value of the kingdom, but you can also say this is the value of salvation. In the parable, a man here finds a treasure hidden in the field. He hides it again. He goes and sells all that he has. He's so overwhelmed with joy that he goes and he buys the field. This man is willing to give up everything. Everything that he had up until that point to get this treasure. He sells everything he has. He goes and buys the field. He makes sure that when he goes back to dig it up, it's there, it's his. He's exposed to the kingdom. Here's the application. He hears the gospel. He recognizes the value of being or entering into the kingdom. He gives up everything he had in his old life. He completely submits to Jesus as his Lord and Savior and he gets saved. That's what the parable here is about. The value of being in the kingdom. Knowing what it means. The gospel is hidden because many hear it and never respond. How many people, if we look at the parable, how many people walked over that field and never knew what was below their feet? They never knew that treasure was there. This man finds it. This man knows the value of it when he sees it. So many walk by or walk over the gospel, they never respond. This parable is about the one that does respond. This man recognizes the kingdom. He recognizes his need to be in the kingdom. He recognizes his need for salvation. And he does whatever he has to do to make sure he gets it. He leaves it all behind, sells it all, gets rid of it all, drops down on his knees, asks Jesus to forgive him, and knows that he's saved. That's what this parable is about. One verse. The value of the kingdom, the value of salvation. <coughs> Similarly, the parable of the pearl. The great value. Verses 45 and 46. Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Now, notice here, in this parable, the kingdom is not the pearls. The kingdom is the merchant seeking the pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this merchant, he's seeking pearls, he finds one of great value, sells everything he has, and buys this one pearl. With the parable of the hidden treasure we just looked at, we see man recognizing salvation's value and seeking the kingdom of heaven. In this parable, these two verses, we see the kingdom of heaven seeking pearls, which is us. God sees value in us to the point where He makes it possible for us to enter the kingdom. These two parables show that man must recognize the value of salvation. Put his faith in Jesus Christ and be saved because that's the only way to be saved. We see here, God draws us to Jesus. God draws us to where we can enter the kingdom. This parable is all about God seeing value enough that He would send His Son to lay down His life on the cross, shed His blood for us, and pay our sin debt in full. That is what, in this parable, that is what it means when He says, and He went and sold all that He had. Jesus gave up His position at the right hand of the Father. He became a man. He lived a sinless life. He died in our place. He paid the price that we couldn't pay. Then He ascended to heaven and we know He's coming back to get us. He sees value in us. You know, God did not have to make a way for us to be saved. God did not have to make it possible for mankind to be redeemed. When Adam and Eve committed sin and fell, 
God could have said, that's it. The great experiment's over. <clears throat> they had it good for a little while, but they screwed it up. But he didn't do that. Why? Because he sees value in you. He sees value in me. He sees value in every one of us. Let us not ever forget Jesus died to pay for the sins of the drug addict the same as he did the one that in human standards didn't do anything wrong. He died for the murderer same as he died for the good old boy up the holler. God sees value in us. So much value that Jesus Christ laid down his life. Let me read this again. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You know, if Jesus laid down his life and only one person throughout all the course of history got saved, it would have been worth what he done. It would have been worth what he done. If we as a church do all we can to lead people to Christ, whether we spend X amount of dollars or we give so much time, we do whatever. If one person comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because of our efforts, it's worth everything we've done. We could spend everything that the church has saved up. Maybe we do one big extravagant event. If one person, one person came to know Christ as Lord and Savior because of it, it would be worth every penny the church spent. If we spent a whole month getting something ready for an event, we gave time, we set everything up, one person gave their life to Jesus Christ, it would be worth it. God sees value in all of us. That's what this parable is about. God sees us as a valuable, valuable pearl. As we get ready to conclude this morning, we've looked at the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven, which are about influence of the kingdom of heaven or the church and also can apply to warnings against external and internal influences in the kingdom. Remember, we must make sure we are the influencers, not the influenced. And then we've looked at these two parables, the hidden treasure and the pearl and how they're about man seeing the value in the kingdom of heaven and salvation and God seeing the value in man enough so that He offers salvation and He draws us to Jesus. And I say this to anybody sitting here, anybody watching or listening, if you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you right now, won't you take advantage of this invitation we're getting ready to give? I'll ask Sister Carla if she would come back to the panel. Page 342. If you would, open your hymnal, stand and sing as we worship our Lord one more time this morning.
church is singing this morning, just as these words say, you can come just as you are. You don't have to clean up before you get saved, because the truth is, you couldn't do that anyway. You come to God just as you are, God will do the cleaning up. You feel the Holy Spirit drawing you today, say yes to Him. watching us live or watching us listen later we'll try to make it a point to say we don't want anything from you we just want you to know the gospel we want you to know that Jesus died to save you the same as he died to save us you don't know him as Lord and Savior won't you let today be the day of salvation we don't want anything from you we want everything from you Try to make it a point also to remind every believer in here that the altar is always open to you. If you're here this morning and you need to talk to our Lord for just a few minutes, you are more than welcome to come up. I can promise you this, he's listening. Because we're ending our invitation this morning does not mean God's through with you. As you go throughout your rest of your day, the rest of your week, if God is speaking to your heart about anything. If you don't know Him as Lord and Savior and He's speaking to you about that, say yes. Say yes and see how much better life can be. If it's something else, if you already know Him as Lord and Savior and He's speaking to you, whatever it is, listen to what He's saying. If He's saying to do something, do it. Tells you to go talk to somebody, go talk to them. It tells you to go do something for somebody, go do it. And I promise you this, God will bless you beyond what you can even imagine. Again, as we end our invitation, God speaks to you. Listen to what He says. We thank you for your attentiveness to God's Word this morning. I'll ask Brother Greg if you would close us out in prayer. Dear Lord, bless you, brother. Thank you for all our blessings in our lives. Most important, our salvation. We're thankful, especially for this wonderful house you gave us to come and praise. Praise you, praise you, Lord. We pray that you watch over all of us until the next time we meet up again, Lord. In Jesus' name.